One of the reasons adults don't go, left school or don't go back to school is because of the costs right now. It's pretty clear, um, even with the structures of financial aid that are available to them, there, it still always seems like a very daunting number, especially when it's not well explained to them about the options for financial aid. And the cost drivers that affect adults are the same cost drivers that are affecting everybody right now. Um, you know, on the public side of higher ed, obviously state support has been dropping. Um, in some states quite precipitously, in other states just much more gradually. Um, and on the private side of higher education, I, I, there's just a whole raft of things that are kind of driving up the, the price tag of higher education, not least of which is the financial aid that colleges are having to provide to, you know, to sort of create a sort of a donut hole out of the middle. They're, they're spending, they're providing um, financial aid, merit aid to certain numbers of students, and that kind of creates a hole in the system. There's a much, I mean, the whole issue of college costs is incredibly complex, though. It's, you know, the factors that affect it are everything from, you know, state, this sort of state um, defunding of higher education. Um, on the cost side of things, colleges are spending more on a lot of things that they never used to spend money on. Um, there, you know, we hear this term administrative bloat. Uh, <laughs> I'm a reporter. I spend a lot of my time trying to cut through, to cut through on the phone to reach the person I'm needing to reach, and it's true that there is a lot more administration in higher education than there ever really used to be. A lot more, you know, vice provost, vice chancellors, vice deans, vice everybody else's out there. Um, that's making, you know, that's adding to the bureaucracy. There's a lot of systems of, a lot of, frankly, technical systems. You know, I. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there wasn't an IT structure the way there is right now in higher education. 25 years ago, I would say the counseling services were probably not nearly as extensive as they were today. Um, 25 years ago, the PR establishment, which for good or for ill, was not as um, extensive as it was today. Um, we can leave that for another day as to whether that's actually improving or uh, improving higher education's reputation in the, in, in the broader world or not. Um, but certainly all these things are there. You know, it was driven home to me, it's been a few years now, but I think if I went back, I would look at this again. I went back several years ago and went to the University of Kansas to do a story about that institution, um, which I referred to it in when I wrote the, the book on American higher education in crisis. Um, I went and looked at that, school, that school's budget over a 20-year period of time. This, this population of the school hadn't really changed. Same number of students, basically the same number of faculty. But 20 years later, the, the cost of the, the budget had about, I can't, I can't remember exactly what the numbers were, but it had, you know, gone, I think gone up by about a third. It was, a, and it, they were, you know, it was still the same size school doing the same kinds of things, but the, the way they were doing them was so much different. Frankly, even the research infrastructure was so much more elaborate than it was years ago. So there are a lot of inherent costs in this. I, I will say there are also colleges you know, there's some 4,000 colleges out there, and every, every, just about every one of them has its own set of infrastructure costs. Um, there's not a lot of very good collaboration in higher education. There's not a, really a, if you're thinking about ways to kind of cut these costs, I, in all other industries in the country right now, we're seeing a lot more consolidation and a lot, uh, you know, you might not like it that your drugstore is now, you know, being owned by, being bought up by Walgreens or something like that. But there are some efficiencies of scale and, and at a lot of levels in other institutions and in other kinds of organizations and in other industries around the country. You don't see very much of that in higher education. Well, you don't now, but I suspect if we, st if we don't start seeing it in five years, we're gonna be, I'd be very surprised. These are, I mean, there, are, there have been some models of consolidation right now. I, I admit myself, I haven't studied them that carefully, but one place that I'm really carefully watching to be, I'm curious about right now is what's been going on in Georgia. There's been a lot of mergers between the public institutions, um, some mergers of two-year colleges into four-year colleges, and some medical colleges into four-year colleges. It, it, you know, what, I'll be the first to admit there are probably some things that get lost in the course of those mergers as well, but that, clearly that's a state that's sort of trying to, you know, take a few steps and take a look at what, it, you know, they, it may have too many colleges for the number of students that it has in the state, or it's, and so it's trying to sort of take a look at that and. I think they used, in Britain back in the day, I think they call that rationalizing resources or something like that. That's like an old Mag Maggie Thatcher term. I think we're gonna start to see a little bit more of that in higher ed. And frankly, I think it's much better for higher ed's sake if, it, if the people in higher ed would start to do this for themselves rather than, 
Um, I don't think too many, I don't think the people in the railroads and all the other industries in Britain loved it when the government came in and ra decided to rationalize all of these services. I think uh, if colleges can't figure out ways to start doing this smartly on their own, they're going to have it done to them.